All right. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. We thank you for signing in for today's webinar sponsored by CC Animal Health. Our topic today is uh, Euthanasia Without Pain. It's presented by Dr. D Kathleen Cooney. Dr. Kathleen Cooney has been practicing advanced end-of-life care since 2006. She is Director of Education for the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy, Guardian Pet Aquamation, and Cooney Animal Hospice Consulting. Dr. Cooney is a past president of the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care and remains active in their organization, including design of their Animal Hospice and Palliative Care Certification Program, which launched in 2016. She's well known for her work in companion animal euthanasia and has authored two books on the subject, along with numerous articles and book chapters. Dr. Cooney is a strong advocate for best practices in all aspects of end of life care and speaks nationally and internationally on such topics. She's currently working towards board certification and animal welfare. So please join me today as we welcome Dr. Kathleen Cooney. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clarify the title a little bit more and say, yes, euthanasia without pain, it can be done. So glad you're all joining today. This is such an important topic. And I'd like to start off by saying that I recognize many of you come from different backgrounds. Uh, we probably have nurses attending and uh, of course veterinarians and grief counselors and maybe even practice managers all participating in today's talk. And you come with your own experiences around euthanasia and you might be here because you do have some, some painful situations, whether or not it's with sedation or you know, pre-euthanasia anesthesia or with the actual euthanasia injection itself and are looking for a better approach or maybe looking for some ideas just to shape up what's already working well and trying to make it even better. So thank you so much for coming in. And a really big shout out to Assisi Animal Health, our sponsors today. I gotta tell you, I am a big fan of this company. I love the products that they put out. In fact, uh, tomorrow I'm actually teaching a euthanasia laboratory with some hospice comfort care uh, combined in with that laboratory. And I'm gonna be demoing my Assisi products. I love the loop. I love the, uh, the new Clinica pad, the big one, and then their loop lounge. So I wanna make sure my entire team is, is aware of, of these wonderful products. So thank you to them for, for bringing this important topic to us today. You'll see down at the bottom right, my name, I am a veterinarian and I'm a CHPV, which stands for a Certified Hospice Palliative Care Veterinarian. And then CCFP stands for Certified Compassion Fatigue Professional. I feel like both of those still need clarifiers so you know what these, what these are behind my name. And yes, I am working on being boarded in animal welfare. That's expected hopefully in 2023. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in. I was telling the ACC team that I have uh, I don't think put this many slides together in one presentation in a long time with hoping to finish it in about 50 minutes. So it's gonna be jam packed, but it's important. All the material is, is there, hopefully gonna make your, your practice and your work very uh, better and advanced. And with the idea that when we know better, we do better. So our agenda, we're gonna very briefly talk about what pet owners consider painful and then if you haven't heard this, this concept of dysthanasia before, I think it's important that we introduce it today. Dysthanasia is this idea of a bad death, right? Uh, a bad death rather than a good death, which is what euthanasia means. And that our clients, our pet owners might be considering anything that's painful during the euthanasia procedure, a dysthanasia. Then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time on pre-euthanasia sedation and anesthesia because that is such an important part of reducing pain during euthanasia. And then just a little bit about the techniques themselves in case you're not familiar with them and the options that are now available to you. So that is our agenda for this hour. As was mentioned in the beginning, I am the Director of Education for the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy. Much of what we are learning today comes from the CADA learning modules. And so I am the founder of this academy as well, because again, when we know better, we do better. So it was important to me to train veterinary professionals on euthanasia best practices. I am also the Chief Medical Officer of Caring Pathways, which is a home hospice and end of life service in Colorado that is uh, 
currently advancing into other parts of the country. And it is their laboratory tomorrow that I'm teaching on all these wonderful euthanasia techniques as well as hospice uh, products and, and available um, therapies that we can use, including the CC, uh, CC line of products. And then I happen to be affiliate faculty at Colorado State University where I teach animal welfare, where I teach euthanasia and hospice training as well. So that's me. This is where I, um, this is what I look like with, but with my animals. And I am here in Colorado, in case you're wondering. So with me, affiliate faculty at Colorado State, I live right along the front range here about an hour north of Denver. So that's where I'm coming to you from today. Now I recognize we don't have a chat feature in this talk today, but you do have a Q&A box. You are welcome to put questions in as we go along. I can also, I should be able to see comments that come in through the Q&A box. And so you're welcome to give me a little bit of feedback on this picture, but I wanted to start off with it. Normally what I do with my CADA training is ask my attendees in the room, what about this image here makes us question what kind of pain or what, what feelings, what physical state this animal might be, might be aware of in this room, right? So we're trying to avoid pain. I think about it that we're trying to avoid pain from the very beginning, right? From the moment the animal walks into the hospital or we're in the home environment, right? So what might this animal be think or feeling and experiencing, okay? So with that, you might be coming to mind that the animal is very aware of restraint, the animal is aware of the table, the animal is aware of the, the sounds and, and smells around the room, and certainly is going to be feeling this catheter being placed in the front left leg. During euthanasia, what we call modern euthanasia or the good death revolution is trying to reduce pain as much as possible for our patients and therefore the emotional pain of our clients as well at every turn, okay? So yeah, a comment coming in about, yeah, there's a tight hold uh, around the neck. It looks uncomfortable. The way the dog's being restrained can be, can be uh, building anxiety, that fear, anxiety, and stress. Now, this looks like a pretty reasonable hold on this dog that's wide awake that might not want this catheter being placed, but our goal, again, is to try to reduce this away, reduce not only the restraint, but reduce the pain that might be felt from that catheter going in. Okay. Yeah, the, the patient is away in the back. We definitely want to avoid that too if we can. So good. Thanks for those comments coming in. But yeah, I think we can all agree that we can do something better here. So ideal components of a quality euthanasia appointment where we're trying to reduce away that pain, first and foremost, is that our animal patient is sleeping. And we're going to go into great detail on that here coming up. No pain on injections, extremely important. So if we're worried about pain, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna reduce that risk? Minimal restraint, safe environment, everybody ready. This is certainly an ideal component for euthanasia where we don't have any of those uh, lingering doubts that this is the right procedure and the right course of action for our patient. We're hoping for a quiet death. And then I should put in parentheses, quick death because a quick death does not necessarily mean a good death. It's just what is most expected in, in today's society and in what we do within euthanasia. But a, a longer extended death is okay as long as there's not pain present. So while we recognize these as ideal components, it's important that we line up with what our pet owners expect as a good death. So I'm very pleased to say that the CADA program is working with Colorado State University on what we call, uh, well, we haven't officially titled it yet. We're about to send out the survey to all the pet owners, but we were considering calling it a dysthanasia study, but it's probably just gonna be more of uh, pet owner expectations around euthanasia and what would equal a good death in their, in their mind and what would equal a bad death. Now we've already done, the CADA program's already done a lot of exploration into this by looking at Google reviews and talking to uh, Google reviews of, of veterinary services, talking to pet owners about their bad um, experience that they had during euthanasia. Number one, top of the list is my pet experience pain. Okay, that's what they don't like. That's what's often going to drive those negative reviews, that bad uh, interpretation of the vet team. 
and leave them feeling very haunted and upset. So we want to reduce away that pain as much as possible. Other things, if you're curious, is that the vet team tend to be very clinical. The family felt rushed. Uh, money was the focus of everything, kind of that type of feedback. But again, number one, they don't want pain. When we look at this picture here, I hope that resonates with you, right? That the last thing we want to do is walk up to this peaceful setting and give the dog an injection and it cries out in pain or tries to bite or, or in other ways shows uh, displeasure with what's happening. Instead, we want it extremely calm. Just before this, this uh, webinar today, I had the honor of releasing a, a blue tick coon hound from its body through euthanasia. And the two people that were present, that was the first thing that they said, is he going to be comfortable? Is this going to be painful? And I was very pleased to be able to say, no, we're gonna make sure that we, we take everything into account and I'm gonna get him used to my touch and, and I'm gonna choose the type of medications that he won't respond to in the proper way, that he's just gonna fall into a deep sleep and then we move forward with euthanasia. So these things are so, so important. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to the 14 essential components of what we call modern euthanasia. And you'll see the acronym along the left that says good, and then euthanasia there on, on the second half of the slide. So good euthanasia. Good euthanasia spells out 14 different letters. And so we've assigned a component to each one of them. What we're gonna focus in on today is letter D and good, deliver proper technique. And then in euthanasia, the letter U, use pre-euthanasia sedation or anesthesia. And then the letter A down below in avoid pain and anxiety, right? But all of these are very, very important to a successful euthanasia. And our goal is that after the end of an appointment, you can either do a physical checklist or a mental checklist and say, did I, did I, did I do these things, right? All the way down. And if you did, then you can stand tall at the, you know, afterwards and said, wow, everything went according to plan. It was very smooth. It's what we wanted. And if something didn't go just right, it's not a failure. It's an opportunity to go ahead and make changes with, with your protocols, as well as your team's protocols to, to have a legacy and something positive that comes from it. Again, we'll circle back around to that coming up. But these are the 14 essential components we're going to focus on D, U, and A. So let's start with pre-euthanasia sedation and anesthesia. Reasons four. Number one, we call it the blessed sleep, right? How many people want their pet to pass in the night where they don't first of all have to make the decision, but what the blessed sleep means to most of us is pain-free. We don't have a lot of pain when we're sleeping. So it's gentle, it's a nice, easy release from their body. Right there with it then equals pain-free. Okay, whatever we're choosing for sedation and anesthesia, trying to reduce down that pain on injection, pain in the mouth if we're working with oral gels or anything like that. But we really appreciate that sleep because it allows for closeness, one person procedure much of the time, technique options increase such as intraorgan injections. And then we like to do it to um, when there is aggression and, and aggression cases that by providing sedation or anesthesia, preferably anesthesia and aggression cases, that we have a much, much more calm and relaxed appointment, right? You better believe these gentlemen have been uh, bonded to this cat from the beginning, and they are very concerned about the, the end journey for, for the sweetheart. They don't want pain. They don't want struggle. They want it to be nice and gentle. I'm sure you have met families like I have over the years that, yeah, they have been thinking about the death of their pet almost from day one, right? The second that their heart has been captured and they've got all these rich stories. You know, in fact, if you've ever heard the poem, The Dash, where the dash represents, you know, like on a headstone or a tombstone uh, between the years of the life, you know, the year of birth and the year of death, that dash in between represents everything, right? Represents everything. And that includes worry about that, that final moment, that final time together. So we wanna get it right. Reasons against sedation or anesthesia, we kind of consider enhancement of a critical state where there maybe already are prone to seizures or prone to breathing difficulty like this picture represents. Certainly there's gonna be uh, added, added expense that comes along with sedation and anesthesia drugs, but 
in my opinion, well worth it. Just roll it into the cost. Yes, it's another injection or maybe an oral med that needs to be given, but it's okay. Again, the, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Little longer appointment time. That's not unusual, but again, very, very beneficial. And every once in a while, we come against a religious conflict where they don't want to give sedation or anesthesia. They want the animal as awake as possible. And in my, in my work, I have found that just being able to give a little bit of a sedative to relax them a bit so that handling is better is usually acceptable for those who are, have some concerns. All right, here are the drugs that we're typically reaching for. And I'm gonna break this down into which are considered sedatives and which are considered anesthetics. But uh, I'm absolutely in love with alpha-2 agonists and dogs, use them all the time. And then certainly opioids, phenothiazines, uh, the benzodiazepines, I don't tend to use as much except in a teletamine zolazepam combo where I've got that zolazepam in there. And then we've got our dissociatives, which are very, very common and the hypnotics and the neurosteroids, which we'll talk a little bit about. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, make sure to clarify right here, I am actually not gonna talk a lot about propofol today. I know a lot of you use it, which is great, but the way that we train is that we're giving something sub Q or IM first, therefore propofol isn't as needed, nor are the gases, right? Those would be most reached for if you've already got an IV catheter placed and you want to induce anesthesia for the propofol anyway, that then we're inducing a state of sleep before euthanasia. But we're going to be encouraging you today to give stuff sub Q or IM to induce sleep before anything technical is done, okay? Before any catheters or butterfly catheters or anything like that is reached for. So here is a list of the sedatives versus the anesthetics. They are different and it's important to recognize that. So if you need a patient really deep in sleep, you need them completely out unconscious. And if you're gonna be dosing at the appropriate levels, you're gonna be then reaching for the anesthetics. You can dose high enough on the sedatives to induce uh, unconsciousness. However, you might get some more side effects with that, like chain stokes breathing, pressures dropping, uh, things like that. So just something to be aware of that if you really need unconsciousness, be reaching for those anesthetics. And a reminder then that a sedative induces a lighter state of sleep, meaning that with enough stimulation, the pet can gain awareness. So I want you to think to yourself, what scenario, if I were doing an intraorgan injection, what would be the scenario of which um, doing something that would invoke enough stimulation that the patient might wake up and cry out in pain? right? First one that comes to my mind is an intracardiac injection, right? It's, a, it's actually a very, very efficient, good technique. But if you are doing it, first of all, in awake animals, please stop. That is against our, our AVMA guidelines, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and as well as, as world guidelines for the most part. But we, we can't do that because it will elicit pain. So we need to make them unconscious and then we can do an intracardiac injection. So if you're just using acepromazine and butorphanol for your intracardiacs, it's not enough, right? That means that you're gonna have a painful euthanasia or risk of it, certainly. All right. So routes of administration for our pre-euthanasia sedatives or anesthetics. Again, we're trying to encourage before any technical work is done. So we're gonna be given these drugs in combination, subcutaneous or intramuscular. Intramuscular has risk of being more painful because we're actually going into tissue. So it's something to consider, but again, we can do it without pain if we, if we take our time and use the right combo of drugs. Then uh, intravenous, certainly, if we've already got a catheter that's placed, let's use it. And then, and then inhalation of gases if appropriate. And then we can certainly give drugs orally as well. So if we've got a patient who is just going to be super, super sensitive to anything we do underneath the body, then we can aim for those oral drugs ahead of time, maybe do like what we call a two-step process. So in this picture that you see here, it's a little chihuahua. So you might be thinking, oh, these smaller dogs, these cats, uh, and certainly exotics and other animals that you might be working with, because I recognize we might have mixed practitioners or, or even livestock practitioners with us today. Generally, the smaller they are, the more worried we are that they're going to feel a needle. So um, this is just a, a demo picture here, but in, in a perfect world, we'd also be offering this little one treats and having more distractions in place. Um, but this is just a demo picture here, but I'm just showing a sub-Q injection. 
So common combinations, we go ahead and show you some here, and then I'll give you my actual preferred protocols that you are welcome to use. But example one here is a sedation protocol. And why is it sedation? Because there's no anesthetics in there. It's got alpha 2s, opioid, and aphenothiazine. Therefore, it's a sedation protocol. Example two is anesthesia because we've got that teletamine in there. As soon as we've got an anesthetic, it's now an anesthesia protocol. Now, that being said, I always give heavy doses of my drugs, right? I want them unconscious. I rarely reach for a dissociative or like ketamine or, or something like alfaxalone or, or something else where it's not going to induce unconsciousness. So if it's just a little touch of it, I might still actually consider that a sedation protocol because we're not putting them into anesthesia. Food for thought. Here's another example here of an anesthetic. That's what, where we're using alfaxalone and then butorphanol and acepromazine. So because alfaxalone's in there at high enough doses to induce unconsciousness, it's an anesthetic protocol. And then here's one with, for those of you who don't have uh, teletamine, for example, we've got ketamine mixed in with midazolam, ACE, and maybe nalbufine. If you're not familiar with nalbufine, it is a kind of in the United States anyway, it's a non-controlled version of like a, like a butorphanol. Now, this is a very important slide. And if you take away nothing else from today, please pay attention here. So common combinations are usually what we consider kind of a one step where you're giving a combination of drugs all together in one syringe, waiting for our pet to be heavily sedated or anesthetized. Then we move forward with euthanasia. Okay? A two-step pre-euthanasia anesthetic protocol, if you will, would be to start with a sedative then with an anesthetic. And the reason to do that is that if we're worried about heat from the injection, like with ketamine, midazolam, with, with, uh, til, uh, with teletamine, then maybe we reach for something that doesn't have as much heat to start us off, okay? How about we start off with butorphanol and acepromazine? Okay, we combine those two together in the syringe when we're ready to administer, give it sub Q or IM, just depending on the patient, go ahead and wait five to 10 minutes until they're very relaxed. Then if we want to induce anesthesia from there, because we're going to do an intraorgan injection, or we really want to make sure that they're completely unaware for any manipulation, manipulation of those limbs, then we can go ahead and give uh, I am injection of ketamine or teletamine, or we're placing an IV catheter and, and administering propofol, okay? I think you get where I'm going with this with example five is that we're doing a two-step protocol, sedation first, relaxing them, then going for anesthesia of some sort, and then euthanasia. Okay, so if you want to take a screenshot, you're welcome to. This is my protocol for dogs. The first one is heavy sedation. I actually give this one typically sub Q because this dexmedetomidine is good and strong. Okay, if you're going to go with it IM, you can actually drop this down a little bit more. Okay, but on average, we're talking about of the 0.5 mg per mil concentration, 0.1 mil per 10 pounds, that's 4.5 kilograms then uh, you can decrease this down a little bit. So for a 50 pound dog, I actually might give 0.4 mil, okay, something like that. With then the opioid that I will mix in with the syringe, I will either use now bufine at 20 mg per mil or butorphanol 10 mg per mil comes out to 0.1 mil per 10 pounds. So again, very similar to the dexmedetomidine volume and then acepromazine, 10 mg per mil, I will half that. So a 100 pound dog, very typical for me to give 0.9 mil dexmedetomidine, uh, one mil of uh, butorphanol, and then a half mil of acepromazine. Okay, very normal combo for me. Love it, good, good, deep sedation. Then for my anesthesia, when I need them unconscious, for sure, for sure, because I'm going into organ, I'm going to go either IM or sub Q. I'm going to be using my teletamine, acepromazine, and a little bit of dexmedetomidine. So if you're, if you're looking at a 100 pound dog, this is a mil of teletamine, it's a mil of acepromazine, and about 0.25 mil of dexmedetomidine. The nice thing about that dex is it just takes some edge off of that dissociative. If you don't have teletamine, you can substitute this in with ketamine and midazolam. Uh, works works very well. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Kathy, what about xylazine? Can we use xylazine in the dogs? 
Absolutely, you can. Your dose would be very similar to this if you're using 100 mg per mil. So instead of the dexmedetomidine here, you would be substituting in xylazine at 100 mg per mil at 0.1 mil per 10 pounds. Pretty typical. Same thing down here with xylazine, 100 mg per mil, you'd be giving 0.025 mil per 10 pounds. Okay, again, 0.25 mil. Um, I'm sorry, 0.25 mil for a 100 pound dog. Now, that being said, I used xylazine for eight years until my good friend Beth Marchitelli said, Kathy, for the love of God, try dexmedetomidine. You're going to love it. It's so much better. And boy, was she right. I, I don't get any lip licking for nausea. I rarely, if ever, get vomiting. I'm trying to think of maybe two dogs my entire time with dexmedetomidine vomited. And uh, if you do need to use an alpha-2 in cats, you've already got the dexmedetomidine ready to go. Um, I don't use dexmedetomidine in cats. In fact, I only use an anesthesia protocol for cats. And it is, for me, it's the teletamine. And I have acepromazine and now bufine or butorphanol. And here's kind of the volume, 0.1 mil per five pounds. Plus, I like to add in some saline to my syringe to cut down on the heat and the sting. And we'll look at a slide talking about that here in a moment. Then uh, my other anesthesia protocol is alfaxalone. Okay, so I'm either going to have teletamine as my main or alfaxalone. And then here's my, uh, here's my doses. Alfaxalone is a pretty hefty amount, but there's no heat to it at all, no sting. 1.3 mil on average per cat. It has no analgesia properties to it, so I still put in an opioid. And then always just acepromazine like water in, in euthanasia. And a total volume per cat is going to come out to about 1.5 mils. Now, why you're asking, Kathy, do you only do anesthesia protocols in cats? It's because intrarenal injections are my preferred technique and I need them anesthetized. I, every once in a while, we'll still place catheters in cats, but it's not typical. It's usually that I'm going intraorgan, so I want them completely anesthetized. So let's talk about removing the dissociative sting. So with re, and, and dissociative is, we all know that ketamine and, and teletamine has a low pH, it, it can have that burn, but so can midazolam, right? So if we're adding in anything that's got heat to it, we wanna understand, first of all, what can make a reaction more noticeable. It's gonna be anything from patient temperament to ex patient's acceptance of handling and resistance to anything that's going on, their previous experience with injections, Oh man, if we're injecting a sore area, that's just, you know, adding, adding fuel to the fire. And then of course, if they've got allodynia or hyper um, anesthesia, where they're really, really sensitive in, in their whole body in general, where they just don't want to be messed with. And then if you're rubbing an area after a dissociative or a heat injection, that can cause some pain too. Those of you Bloom County fans, I had to throw in Bill the cat. He's the he just reminds me of, ah, oh, where am I going to touch this one and have him and have him not be too sensitive. So we're going to go over in just a moment with uh, a bit more about the pH, but we need to prepare our clients for possible pain. So again, it can be done where there's going to be no pain at all. And that's going to be the bulk of your euthanasias. However, if we're a little bit concerned about it, these are some of the uh, narratives that I might use, right? Asking, has he, how has he been with injections in the past? Is he sensitive somewhere I should know about? Then letting him know this medicine has a little bit of a heat to it, but I'm going to really take my time. I'm going to go slow. He's in good hands with me, trying to reinforce that trust, okay? Sometimes I've heard people say, or, or veterinary teams say, uh, uh, this can sting, this can burn. Okay, or if he cries out, um, if he, he might cry out, he may vocalize. I tend to dilute it down a little bit, make it a little bit more benign with, if he talks to me, I understand. Uh, if she notices, she's gonna welcome that sleep really quickly to try to lessen uh, the impact and the focus on it as much as possible. Oh, I've got some good kind of questions coming through. Um, I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick to a lot of these at the end because I think they're all applicable to everything we're talking about here. But keep those coming; those are great. So removing the sting, we've done a. I've done a little bit of exploration with some colleagues about what can we do with that uh, teletamine in particular, whether or not we can dilute it with something different than sterile water, or can we put in something to our syringe before we inject that's going to reduce away that heat. 
So I had worked a bit with buffered lidocaine, not too much great success, mostly because I couldn't get that, that buffered lidocaine right where I wanted it at about seven. Uh, working with bicarb plasma light, which has a little bit higher pH than saline. Uh, vitamin B12 has gotten a lot of press, a lot of, a lot of action out there in the field. I'm not quite sure why it works, but uh, everybody, a lot of people swear by it, but um, I've, I've still seen it hit or miss. Just say promazine can make a difference and then whether or not we're adding in butorphanol. And I'd be curious, of course, if you have any other things that you wanna share, I'm all ears and you can put that in the Q&A box. Um, this is just to remind us, and by the way, with Halloween coming up in less than a week, this is a dog dressed in bacon. I think bacon is a fabulous thing to give to animals as a distraction, but the idea is treats, treats, and more treats, right? If we're really trying to take away them feeling anything, whether or not it's a dissociative or just butorphanol and ACE, right, combined together, what can we do? We distract, right? That's really good, just fear-free protocols. I just thought this was an adorable picture of a dog dressed as bacon. In fact, my favorite distraction treat that was ever brought into my comfort center here in Colorado where I'm seated was a bowl of bacon grease. And man, I don't think that dog would have noticed anything I did anyway. However, he was so focused in on that bacon, bacon grease, he was having the time of his life. So just taking a quick look at pH. So pH by itself is listed here in the middle. And then when it's mixed with telazole, I did a lot of uh, meter reading on it. And uh, telazole already by itself was I think 2.6, uh, something like that if memory serves is definitely below three. But uh, if you mix in it with saline, it's still less than three. Plasma light could bump it up to a pH of four. So we're getting better towards that pH of seven. Uh, and then buffered lidocaine, again, didn't really make much of a difference. B12 didn't make it much of a difference, but look at B12 still has a pretty low pH. It's not like it's a, it's a high pH, which would buffer it out. So uh, when we tested it, it was still uh, relatively low. So that's why I'm not sure why it works, um, but it might be neutralizing an alcohol or, or something else. Bicarb, huge difference. And I'm gonna show you an example of, of something that works well here coming up next. pH buffering solution, I tried to mess around with that, didn't have much success. And then acepromazine at least pulled it up above three. So I'd like to share with Dr. Beth, Beth Marchitelli out of North Carolina has had great success with. In fact, this is a good time as any. This is a book, it's probably backwards for you and I apologize, can't, can't tell what you're seeing here. But this is a book written by uh, many, many experts. I've got a chapter in here myself, but it's edited by Beth Marchitelli and Tammy Shear. Really good book that came out in 2020 on small animal euthanasia. And then this is another good book for you, Veterinary Euthanasia Techniques, A Practical Guide. Also a good uh, reference for decreasing pain and proper techniques. But uh, Beth, this is, her, this is what she does. This will be a great time to do a screenshot. She works with telazole regularly, acepromazine, butorphanol, plasmalite, and bicarb. She gives a sub-Q injection in the neck region with a small 27 gauge needle using, using uh, in the first syringe, plasmalite. I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. She is going to give it in, I'm not saying this well at all. Let me start again. So she puts in one syringe, plasma light with two to three drops of bicarb. Then in a second syringe, she's got her telazole combo that has telazole ACE and butorphanol. Then right before the injection, she combines the two together, leaves a little bit of room for fizzing. Then she actually checks the pH. And if it's not to that pH of 6.75 or seven, she actually drops in another drop of bicarb. Okay, test it again. She just kind of does this on the side when the owner's in the room, she does a lot of home services. And when it's just right, then she goes ahead and injects and best swears by this. She says it works wonderful. I think it's a great option. So giving sub Q and IM injections, you know, our mantra is to move slow, go be calm, distract when you can, prepare the pet by rubbing the area tent the skin often. You'll see me do that here in a, in a video. And then inject slowly unless you have to go fast, right? We don't want to blast that in with a fire hose. Common injection sites typically for sub-Q, it's going to be in the shoulder blade region uh, where they're used to getting uh, vaccinations or even, even insulin injections. 
uh, where there's a lot of loose skin, that's the goal. And if you're going, I am typically apexial muscles are very, very good thigh. And then my last resort would be the triceps. Okay. And then uh, tips to inject again, slowly, small gauge needles, try not to blast it in and then rub afterwards to help with absorption, but be careful of that dissociative burn. You don't want to like put in teals, all ketamine or midazolam, and then just start rubbing right? Because there can be some, some uh, damage to skin there and we don't want to, I'm sorry, to the tissue and we don't want to make it worse. Maybe just give a moment before you start rubbing in. So let's watch a quick video of a, oh, it's just going to automatically play. There we go. You're just going to see me give a teletamine injection on this kitty cat. We're not going to watch her relax all the way down. Now, I'm not technically fully on scrubbing her, but I'm just letting her know I'm there, keeping her in position, giving it as slow as I possibly can. Worked out well. With a dog here, this is just a sub-Q injection. I'm gonna tent often. I'm not sure if you can see the little photo bomber in the window right there, but I'm gonna just get her used to my touch. I'm gonna tent, 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 and go ahead and go in, draw back and inject. Good. All right. This is not as particular with pain, however, I just wanna put out there to you that I do think it's important to remain present during sleeping time when they're starting to succumb to the meds that you've given. So it is safest to stay in the room rather than just stepping out and letting the animal relax without you there. This helps you to anticipate the needs of the pet and the caregiver and support whatever's happening. Explain what's happening, right? Create a calm setting. And then once they're sound asleep, then you can go ahead and begin making your preparations for euthanasia. Oral sedatives, very useful. Wouldn't it be great if all animals just did this, like get it in my belly. They open up the mouth, they take whatever you're gonna give. Ah, it'd make things so much easier, but we know that's not the case. But it is very, very useful in many of our patients. It eliminates that FAS, that fear, anxiety, and stress. But we know that success is highly variable. So it's best to give things well in advance. And rather than going through everything today, I just want to direct you to a CADA blog called Oral Pre-Visit Pharmaceuticals for Euthanasia with this idea of going big. It's okay that we give more than we typically would give. And I also talk about the chill protocol in there that came out of uh, Tufts and um, where I tend to go a little bit higher than what the typical chill protocol is, because again, it's going to be euthanasia. So some key points before we move on here. The goal is for peaceful, pain-free passing. There are many options for you. You're gonna find those that you can rely on that are tried and true. But if you are getting some reactions, um, I encourage you to, to learn as much as you can from the CADA program, read books, um, go, to, go to conferences, learn everything you can about pre-euthanasia, sedation, anesthesia, and then certainly um, better techniques as well, okay? Don't forget that that sedation anesthesia is now gold standard by the ABMA, by AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association, by CADA, Fear Free, and many other groups, okay? Standardize their use that takes away some of the unknowns. Choosing the right technique. We're gonna switch gears and talk about euthanasia real quick. Um, again, we can have four hours just on this slide alone where we really start to break it down. But I just wanted to remind us that there are different techniques and that we have to think about uh, all these different parameters before we just grab one. I'm a big fan of plan A, B, and C, okay? So it's uh, what you choose is gonna depend on all these things. And as we talked about before, the presence of pre-euthanasia, sedation, or anesthesia, we cannot be doing intra-organ injections unless they are completely unconscious. So we certainly have intravenous as a, as a choice. This is gonna be common for many of you. These are just some examples of different ways that you can place your, your indwelling IV catheter with either an extension or a male adapter. I'm a big fan, Kate is a big fan of indwelling catheters. It reduces your risk, it's the safest approach, but you have ultimately have the choice of just going with a uh, butterfly or direct venipuncture, okay? But it is safest to place a catheter. So I'm just gonna pop back to that slide again. You don't have to tape it into 
the nine, you can just anchor it in. Remember, your patient is already sound asleep. And so they should be very uh, accepting of everything that you're doing with the leg. And just a reminder of how important it is to shave if you're worried about accessing the vein the first time. So I encourage you to shave. Your patient will not respond to it because they're already anesthetized or heavily sedated. They, they shouldn't even notice the clippers. I imagine you have some preferred veins. There's lots of different veins to work with. In fact, in cats, I know a lot that like the medial saphenous. Some of you like the dorsal pedal vein uh, in dogs in particular, but lots to work with. The, in, the goal is to find one that works well and stick with it as much as you can. All right, intracardiac is another option for you. Intracardiac, again, they need to be completely out. So if you have them in light sedation, they will be painful. Uh, and that is technically malpractice. So stay away from that. Make sure they're anesthetized. And then you can do what's what I'm showing down here, which is a real slick way to hide the injection. In fact, this little extension line right here attached to the needle going into the heart is often shielded by my hand, but I needed you to be able to see it for the picture. Um, by the way, I prefer Fatal Plus, which is why the blue solution is here. It's, it's um, perfect for, for euthanasia. Or you can do direct, what we call heart puncture, which you're not using an extension, it's just needle and syringe directly into the heart. Um, but that is a little bit more obvious to people who are watching. Intrahepatic injection is a great one. Look at how big our target is for many of our patients. This one, I'm a little bit high up on the side, usually you go a little bit closer to the xiphoid process, a um, little bit better image right here, but that's it's as simple as that, is injecting in once they're anesthetized. Intrarenal, we're aiming for either the left or the right kidney and uh, trying to go into the cortex or the medullary area, trying to avoid uh, the medulla right here, and I'm sorry, the renal, um, pelvis and then down into the ureters. So you can go with the medullary area and the cortex is just fine. But again, cat needs to be completely anesthetized. This also works great for exotics. Really any animal that you can feel the kidney that they're anesthetized, you're good to go. It's, it's a very area, a good area of high perfusion. Take those drugs right up to the brain to do their work. That's why we go for intra-organ is when it's difficult to find the vein or it's going to be too obtrusive. We go ahead and go for an organ that has high perfusion. I'd like to actually show you a video of an intra-renal injection if you've never seen it before. I hope you find this interesting and useful. So here, this cat is already anesthetized with a Tealzol combo. She was actually the one you saw me give that uh, IM thigh injection to. And so now I'm reaching for her left kidney. I lift it up into my left hand. I inject directly with needle and syringe. And I go ahead and infuse in very slow. Um, and then you're going to watch her breathing. She's going to take a deep breath right there and very, very gently have an exhale. And it's that efficient. It's a very elegant technique. And again, euthanasia, no pain. It can be done. Interperitoneal is another option. Now, if we're talking about no pain and a guarantee of no pain, I still would recommend sedation and anesthesia, even though intraperitoneal injections do not require that by AVMA guidelines. So in the shelters, for example, they regularly do intraperitoneal injections on awake animals. And the studies out there, there's still some questions about whether or not animals react to it or not, uh, because euthanasia solution is very caustic. It's a very high pH. And if we're accidentally infusing it into a loop of intestine or into an organ when they're awake, then that can elicit pain. So um, I would still encourage you to give sedation or anesthesia before you do an intraperitoneal. But frankly, if they're anesthetized, why not go for an organ, right? It's gonna go faster because we know intraperitoneal can take a bit of time. Here is actually two different injection sites. I was always taught to go just caudal to the umbilicus and a little bit to the right side. And same here with this cat um, demonstrating that. This one, I've also seen it given a little bit higher up on the flank area. The goal is to just gently insert a smaller needle, maybe not as big as an 18 gauge that I typically use for intraorgan, but uh, maybe a little bit smaller needle so that the animal is not as aware of its entry into the through the body wall but then you're gonna just pop through the body wall, draw back for negative pressure, and then start a slow infusion in. In fact, this would be a good time to also say, 
that if you think your patient is anesthetized or unconscious and you're going intraorgan or even intraperitoneal like this, still don't just blast it in. Okay, don't blast it in. Give just a little bit to start, right? Maybe 0.1 mil, 0.2 mil. Just start to trickle that into the area and then go ahead and start to infuse in more. If you blast it in, if your patient is not as deep in sleep as you were hoping, they could wake up and cry out in pain. And I've heard the sad stories about it. So do just a little bit of a test. Make sure they're as deep as you think they are. With that in mind, how do we test? We test by doing really good deep toe pinches, okay? That's why you grow your little nail pinchers, right? To try to, to try to work that flesh in between the toes and make sure they don't respond. You can stroke the tail. You can uh, go ahead and turn on your clippers in some instances if you're doing a IV catheter placement, make sure they don't respond to that. You can tickle the feet. You can go ahead and kind of stroke up around the, the face a little bit and do just a little uh, palpebral reflex test. Probably not corneal, but just palpebral. Just make sure they don't respond to that. Making sure they're very deep before you proceed. So, what to do when pain happens. Remember, we're hopefully not going to have any pain. We're gonna follow these, these practical tips here today. But if you notice pain, if pain is, is actually unavoidable and the, you can tell that your client has picked up on it and it's causing them stress, just let the family know you're gonna be calling just to see how they're doing, call within 24 hours, and then provide time to talk about what happened. And what's important about this is that your perception of what happened might be different of what their perception is. So if, if you think, if you know that pain happened and you're concerned about their, their reaction, you know, the family's reaction to it and their perception, but you're not quite sure if they thought anything was amiss, just let them know you're going to be calling to see how you're doing. You don't have to necessarily say this was terrible and I'm going to call you tomorrow to see how you're doing, right? Just kind of go a little bit more organic with that and just let them know that we call all of our families and we're going to be calling them within the next day just to see how you're doing and then see how they're doing, right? Yesterday was a hard day. How are you doing, right? Or how can I support you today? Those things. And then give them a chance to then maybe open up to sharing their concerns. If pain did happen, definitely create a positive from it. What am I gonna do next time? What is our team gonna do next, different next time to try to avoid that? Talk, talk together. And then protecting the team. It can be very traumatic when a euthanasia doesn't go the way that we want it to go. So one of the things that I always uh, train or that we do within the CADA program is this importance of self-regulation. Be relaxed before you even go into the appointment so that if things get challenging, you're already calm, right? You're, you're not ratcheted up from the start. So get in a, a, a tone of self-regulation, relaxation. Be very mindful. Be very present during the euthanasia. If need be, limit the number of appointments that are being done, right? Ask everybody, how many euthanasias can you do in a day, in a week, in a month? And then try to match that as best you can. Do regular check-ins by management to see how they're doing, trying to check in on that compassion fatigue, and then educate, educate, educate. We're doing a great job today by learning something very important about reducing pain and euthanasia, but there's so much more that we can do. But by protecting the team, we get to harness this idea of you harmony, right? Where euthanasias are never scary, they're never overwhelming, where they can actually be a positive part of our day. And they are positive when we do it right. But if that is a struggle and you're just not getting euthanasia down the way that you want it to, please remember that there are experts out there that can, that can be called upon to perform euthanasia instead of you or instead of your team, right? We're so blessed right now that in the United States and in Canada and different parts of the world, there are mobile euthanasia specialists or hospice specialists that can go into the home and help or have comfort centers like I do here in Colorado that you can refer clients and patients to if you're just not convinced that it's gonna go the way that you want it to go. Leverage those experts that know, know all those right techniques. All right, so as we wrap up and open it up for Q&A, just want you to think to yourself already, today I learned three things, right? What are three things that you can immediately apply into practice or talk to your team about starting to make some changes? If you don't already have a euthanasia training manual, 
CADA program can help you to create one or you can start to build your own, but you should have a training manual that everybody follows. And the goal is to reduce pain and, and, and leverage those proper techniques to support the clients in the best way and especially your team too, all right? So when we, again, when we know better, we do better. Quality euthanasia is outstanding medicine. It's good animal welfare, and it helps with our respected industry that we want to maintain uh, for decades and centuries to come, right? So we need to do euthanasia well. With that, I will invite you, if you are not already a member of this group, CADA program has a pet euthanasia forum where we have all sorts of different veterinary professionals that are part of the group, where we talk about cases, we update you on research, we just debrief on all kinds of different things. And everybody that is a part of a veterinary team is welcome to join. And it is open and active today. So feel free to sign up for this. You can find it through the main CADA Facebook page, as well as going to this URL itself.